Okay, so today I'll be talking about old Burmese. Uh, the Burmese are relatively speaking late comers to, uh, let's say, to the Irrawaddy Valley. And before Burmese, the Pew, which is a Sino Tibetan language, and Mon, which is not a Sino Tibetan language, were already spoken and written in what is now Burma for several centuries. The Burmese came down from the hills uh, around the turn of the millennium. Uh, and established the Pagan dynasty at Pagan. And we know they came from the north for two reasons. One is that uh, the close, most closely related languages to Burmese, the Burmish languages, are all still spoken in the Sino-Burmese borderland. So basically you have sort of six, seven languages. They're all still there at the border in the hills, except for Burmese. But also, and I think this is just kind of cute, which is why I'm pointing it out, the word for south in Burmese is the same as the word for mountain. And of course, if you're in Burma, the mountains are to the north. So we have to presume that at one point when they came up with the word south, the mountains were to the south and then they crossed the mountains and uh, kept the word south as meaning mountain or as synonymous with mountain, even though now the mountains were to the north. And the oldest uh, document in Burmese is from 1113. It's called the Miyaza Di inscription. And it's, this is not quite true, but basically it's also the, the youngest Pew document. So it's quite, uh, it's, it's, it's quadrilingual and it shows you that, that transition, right? Where that at that moment, it was important to do things in both Pew, the sort of traditional language and Burmese, the new language. Uh, and it marks that transition point. Okay, here's the Burmese alphabet, and you say, well, kind of looks like what you expect in the lands influenced by Indic culture. And it has all of the uh, things necessary for Pali, and even in fact Sanskrit, although those really rarely come up in, uh, in spoken Burmese, and as far as we can tell uh, through all of its time, uh, these these kind of particularly Indic features like voiced aspirates and retroflex stops were never pronounced as such. It's just a sort of orthographic uh, conceit to to write uh, Indic words the way they're spelled. So what do we need to know in terms of actual Burmese phonology? Well, here are the old Burmese onsets. There is no voicing contrast, but instead an aspiration contrast in the stops. But in the resonance, there's what's also written as a aspiration contrast, but where uh, there's good reason to think that the, let's say, the aspirate resonance are voiceless. And actually, I'll just uh, sort of tell an anecdote from my own life, which is that um, Newar has things written as, say, NH, and um, Burmese has things written uh, as NH, but when you, when you speak the two languages, you realize they're very different sounds. So in Burmese, it's really na, right? So it's, vo it's um, voiceless. And if anything, the aspiration starts before the onset, you know? Um, it, whereas in Newar, you really say na. So it's voiced and the aspiration follows the, the release of the stop. So I had this terrible problem when I was learning Newar of of using the Burmese style uh, aspirate uh, uh, nasals, uh, which made my <laughs> teacher just think I was terribly odd. Yeah, because it's it's not a problem that they they usually get with English speakers, I guess. Uh, so that's just a point about the 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 phonetic interpretation of what are written as uh, aspirate resonance. And then here are some clusters. Uh, it, these are nice, I think, because. Um, it's more medial distinctions than a lot of Sino-Tibetan languages have, including Old Chinese. This is the state of affairs uh, in Old Burmese on the way to what we can call written Burmese. Uh, the, the, the L clusters disappear, and they disappear in an interesting way, which is that after velars, uh, they merge with 
the ya, so so kla changes to kya, and after the labials, uh, the pla merges with pra. So you have to be a, a little bit on your toes when you're looking at a kya in Burmese. Uh, is it secretly a kla? And uh, when you're looking at a pra, is it secretly a pla? But uh, old Burmese does distinguish them, so you, it, it becomes a philological question. And there are some resources for uh, you know, looking into this. I put the RHY in, in parentheses because it really only comes up in one word, and that word is actually never written at RHY, but you can sort of phonemically analyze it in that way. And that's the word for eight, the number eight. Yeah. So here are the vowels. Nothing super exciting, although you might say that you find this I followed by a Y, so E, a little strange in contrast with the simple E. Yeah. Uh, Old Chinese is also reconstructed by Baxter and Cigar as having the sequence, they write I, J, uh, but it, I don't think it contrasts with I. So uh, probably actually the, the, you know, um, the, the realization of the I in these two situations was different, where it was kind of closer to a schwa fall before the Y. But in any case, they write these two things as I and IY. And I think in deference to the uh, phonological analysis that the uh, the Burmans themselves proposed in their orthography, I think we should keep it that way. Yeah. So here are um, the vowels A and E. And then <clears throat> here are the vowels O, U, and uh, uh, let's say. Uh, here we need a few more remarks. So particularly, there's an instability in early Old Burmese orthography uh, that eventually gets resolved as this O1 being, being written WA, W -A, uh, but the O2 always being O. Uh, but in early Old Burmese, both O's, O1 and O2, are written as O with some instability. So I think partly on etymological grounds, it's clear that uh, what happened was uh, we start writing down the language at a point where um, you know some sound changes are kind of just about to happen or maybe in progress. I don't really believe in sound change in progress for methodological reasons, but leave that to one side. Uh, so the O2 can be seen phonologically just as uh, as the U vowel before velars. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly, if, if you wrote it that way, it would look simple, right? You would just have a full set of U's and a full set of O's. Uh, but because the Burmese themselves write the, the allophon of U before velars as O, then, then we should do that. And that's why I distinguish this O1 and O2. It's maybe worth saying that um, this analysis, I'm, I'm not at all the only person who's done this. Pang Wuyun does it. Uh, 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 Mang Wun, I think, uh, as far back as the 30s, follows an analysis like this. But it's an analysis that uh, James Matisoff has a distinct, uh, kind of a very strong, very strongly felt uh, objection to. And he has an article from 2015 uh, about what an idiot I am for uh, having this analysis of the, of the old Burmese vowels, which you can you know look into if you want. Uh, and then finally, this last vowel, it has a wider distribution in middle, or let's say in in written Burmese, but in old Burmese it only occurs before w. And uh, let's say it's a schwa probably. I mean they write it as a combination of a u and an i, so. You know, and, and so we transliterate it as UI, but we, we could just as easily transliterate it as, a, as an IU. The I is written above and the U is written below. So it's, it's some kind of diacritic four vowel that, uh, that the, the script that, that uh, let's say, Indic languages don't have to, to simplify. It probably comes from Mon, both the, the vowel and the orthographic device for writing it, and it's probably a schwa. Okay. And now a tricky thing, which is that in modern Burmese, uh, we can distinguish between a n tilde with just one nya and a n tilde n tilde with two nyas. 
I won't get into it. There's actually the, the pronunciation of these in, in modern Burmese, in Burmese is actually a little complicated. Let's not uh, get into it. But in any case, um, there's there's a um, there's a, a kind of distinction that is made orthographically that does index at least one real phonetic distinction in modern Burmese. But this practice of clearly distinguishing the two uh, really only stabilized very late, as Nietzsche has, has proven in the 1950s. But the distinction goes a long way back. So in old Burmese, the first one, so the an, uh, corresponds with y-a-n, so yan, with a medial ya, if you like. Uh, and the second one is just written an. So um, in my uh, cognates, you will see that I always write the double nya, uh, kind of for clear for the sake of clarity, right? Because then you always know that the the double nya is the thing that ends up as double nya in modern Burmese, and the old Burmese yan is old Burmese yan. So then we can kind of avoid having to deal with this issue. But anyhow, I, I want to flag it uh, for uh, you. So yeah, so generally you can understand the Burmese letters as you know as as this is the nice thing about about a language and alphabet is is the phonological analysis of the script has a few little things that I've discussed, but it's pretty simple. So a few changes from old Burmese to written Burmese. The first one I've already mentioned. Uh, so O one becomes Wa, I Y becomes the vowel E, uh, U Y becomes W. Uh, so one thing you notice is that old Burmese doesn't really have the vowel e. Yeah. Uh, this u i w is is it, it? This might just be orthographic. Is rewritten as u i. It's less. It's more economical if you like. And then yat changes to yach and yan changes to yan yan. Yeah. Okay. Also, because of loan words, we start getting this u i vowel before velars. And, and I, I should say, uh, everyone seems to think this, and it's extremely hard, basically impossible, to find Sino-Tibetan cognates for words that end in this UI uh, velar nasal or UIK in Old Burmese. Uh, but uh, it's not the case that we have good etymologies for all of them. So that's one sort of thing, some desideratum in Sino-Tibetan uh, linguistics is to really prove that that all of the old Burmese words that have this uh, rhyme are loans from uh, Mon or other languages. Okay, so that was it for old Burmese synchronic phonology, if you like. Now just a word about uh, the Burmish family. So I think I did some of this on the first day. This is a list of, of Burmish languages. They're all spoken, as I said, along the Sino-Tibetan, sorry, sorry Sino-Burmese border area. Um, and then uh, Lolo-ish, I only mentioned because it might, you know, you might be wondering, there's this thing, Lolo-Burmese, one half is Lolo-ish. It was reconstructed by Bradley in 1979. I'm in my book here, I just leave it entirely to one side. Because uh, I don't, I don't feel very impressed with the work that's been done so far, but I don't have the time or interest to totally redo it. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just setting it to one side. Um, yeah. So now we're going to go from uh, Burmese backwards uh, through some sound changes uh, to Proto-Burmish. And there's a stop along the way, which is that Achang and Shan, Shandao seem to be particularly close to Burmese. So we'll sort of, we sort of start from Old Burmese, we take a look at Achang Shandao, we see where we are, then we look at the other Burmish languages, we see where we are, and then we add to looking at Tibetan and Chinese to get all the way back to Sino-Tibetan. So it's a kind of path from Burmese to Sino-Tibetan with two stops along the road. But as the very first thing to say, uh, we will end up looking at a tonal split in the Burmish languages other than Burmese uh, in order to prove that this aspiration distinction that Burmese has began life as a voicing uh, 
distinction. So a pH, uh, so uh, P in Burmese, uh, and by that I mean any stop, right? Aspirated stops in Burmese correspond both to Lashi high checked tones, and I'm using Lashi here, but I could, I could use any of the Burmish languages other than Achang and Shandao. So you see, uh, you know, the evidence. Yeah. So both languages have aspirate initials, and Lashi has high tone. But we've also got uh, non aspiration correlating with low tone. So the um, the, the argument is a, really a phonetic one, which is that aspiration versus non-aspiration do not cause this kind of tonal difference. Um, you may be wondering, look, uh, it, the, the, the encoding of the tonal difference in Lashi is um, redundant with that aspirate, uh, non-aspirate initial, so maybe it's not even a phonological issue. Um, that's because we're only looking at checked syllables, but there are tonal uh, this, th these tones uh, exist in other syllable types. So it is a, a phonological distinction, just have my reassurance, but we're not looking at Lashi phonology here, so we don't worry about it. Uh, the point is that uh, reconstructing a voicing distinction explains where the tonal split in the Burmish languages came from. So so that's why, uh, even though uh, nowadays everybody in the whole family agrees it's a P versus PH distinction, we have to reconstruct a B versus P distinction. Okay, now that was the first, you know, sound change. Now we're moving backwards in time, and um, and I call this next one Matasoff's law. So it's the change of sh to sa and ch to ts, which are mergers. So some, some uh, examples. To be reconstructed as, this is quite straightforward. Burmese has S, Lashi has S, we reconstruct S. But in these cases, Burmese has S and Lashi has Sh. And you notice that it's not like there's an obvious phonological conditioning for the palatization in Lashi. It happens before different vowels. So, um, so we have to reconstruct a sub versus sh distinction that Burmese lost. And similar now for tsa. Uh, <clears throat> let's just look at eat, because we have some nice uh, sound to and cognates there. It's really clear that uh, Burmese cha goes back to za and uh, tsa in, in, in Lashi. Uh, but there's also these cases where Burmese cha goes back to cha, as we can see from the cognates in uh, in other Burmish languages. And I default to, to Lashi because Lashi uh, preserves uh, a lot of these contrasts in more phonotactic environments than, than other languages. But where a Lashi cognate isn't available, I, I pull them from other languages. Right? Okay. So now we've established that there's this law, Matasov's law, uh, where where Burmese merges Shansa, merges Chansa, and we ask ourselves, what do Achang and Shandao do? Because that should point to a point, uh, you know, a, a point intermediate. And the, the answer is, well, no surprise, they have Sa for Sa. And they seem uh, not to have changed Sha into Sa. So you look at some of the relevant words, and they have some kind of, uh, you know, let's say something more complicated than sa. But it's a little more complicated because they, they've undergone um, their own palatalizations, like you see in the word for liver, where Lashi do doesn't have a palatal, but Achang and Shandao do. So that, I mean, that's not a shock, right? Because uh, Achang and Shandao, are, we may be using to undo uh, sound changes in Burmese, but they underwent sound changes of their own. Yeah, so in this environment, their testimony is, is uh, not reliable. Yeah. And this change 
sets uh, Shut uh, sets Burmese apart from the whole family. Now, one very interesting complication uh, is the Achang word for tree. So it's Sang. Yeah. And why is it interesting? Well, it, it has a non-palatal initial, whereas all the other Burmish languages have a palatal initial for, for this word. And also, uh, its final agrees with Tibetan and Chinese against all other Burmish languages. So it's strange. And I think there are two uh, explanations, and they're both possible. One is that some, for some reason, um, uh, oh, I misspelled Achang in the title. Sorry about that. Um, so one explanation is that, let's say, randomly almost, Achang borrowed the word for tree from Jingpo. And Jingpo is the kind of lingua franca in this area of, of, of Burma. It's also a sign of Tibetan le uh, language. And it has a, a, a word for tree like uh, uh, sing or song. Uh, so that's one possibility. But I think it's a kind of strange word to borrow. So the other possibility is that uh, um, there was some kind of alternation even in Sino-Tibetan between uh, Sikh and Sing as words for tree, which we have to reconstruct anyhow, just because of the Burmese versus uh, Tibetan and Chinese um, evidence. And somehow uh, Achang preserves that as a relic. That's kind of the the analysis I would like to go with because it's more exciting, uh, but uh, it could be figured out, I think, by looking more closely at, at Jingpo. Okay, now uh, we look at the affricates, uh, which is to say we looked at Matasov's law in Achang and Shandao in terms of this sha to sa change, but we didn't look at the sha to sa change, and it's really complicated. So uh, Shandao has four different correspondences with uh, Burmese uh, CH. And I'm just not going to worry about it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Achang Shandao problem. OK. Moving on, which is also, broadly speaking, moving backwards, further back in time. We have Wolfenden's law. So this is that ik in, I don't know, Sino-Tibetan or Proto-Burmish changes into ach and ing changes into an. So very clear examples. Uh, neck, name, we've seen name before in other lectures, long, ripe. And here are examples of ik. So, um, Let's look at tree, because we were just talking about tree. So you see that Burmese has such, Atsi has sick. And I think it should be reconstructed as sick in Proto Burmish. Achang and Shando do not undergo Wolfenden's law, which is to say, it's it, like Matasov's law, is a particularity specifically to Burmese. And you can see that if we look, let's just stick with tree at the words for tree, where we already talk, talked about the strange Achang word, uh, but the Shanda word ends with a K. So there you go. And that was it uh, for that law. Now, um, this one I call Mao Wun's law, which I, I talked about kind of right at the beginning in, in terms of sort of phonological analysis, um, <clears throat> which is that this O2 in Old Burmese only occurs before velars, and it seems like it would be economical to understand it as coming from an U vowel. So here's some evidence. It doesn't get better than six, actually. Six is krok in written Burmese, uh, and I am saying it comes from something like Kruk. And if you look at Lashi, ah, it's Kyuk, so you get exactly the vowel you want. Uh, and it matches Tibetan and Chinese. Uh, and poison is also just one of the, the, like I mentioned before, one of the best Sino-Tibetan cognates, so let's look at that one. Tok comes from Duk, and Duk perfectly matches uh, Tibetan Duk and uh, Chinese Duk. Okay, so that's Maung Wun's law, also characteristic of Burmese only.
yeah or maybe i've uh misspoken it's unclear whether uh Achong and shandao have um have undergone it in most cases so we look at six again crock you have two in in shandao looks like it went through manwen's law uh, but there are some words where uh shandao has an all uh where you would say it you know so these are examples where Achang and Shando seem not to have undergone Mangwen's law. And these are examples where Shandao, at least, seems to have undergone uh, Mangwen's law. So, uh, you know, so it's, it's a little unclear. And uh, looking at uh, Achang, evidence that it has not undergone Mangwen's law and evidence that it has undergone Mangwen's law. So the timing of Mangwen's law in terms of the split of, you know, let's say Burmese clearly underwent it, Proto-Burmish clearly hadn't, as revealed by languages like Atsi and Lashi, but it's unclear at this intermediate stage uh, what happened. More work to be done there. Oh, and uh, Achang has this, has this third uh, vowel, which makes me wonder whether the people who were doing field work on, on Achang maybe just uh, could have worked harder to come up with a phonological analysis. Okay, now, you know, another step backwards in time. Berling's law, the loss of pre-glottalized consonants from uh, Proto-Burmish to Burmese. So Proto-Burmish maintains a three-way contrast in obstruents. And uh, Lashi maintains the um, preglottalized consonants in the widest uh, context, which is why I look at it. So to start with, the very simple case, everybody agrees at um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit tricky to state because the correspondence is between aspirate uh, voiceless stops in Burmese and aspirate voiceless stops in Lashi, which because of the tonal split we mentioned earlier, we reconstruct as unaspirated voiceless stops. So here you have ka, ka corresponding, which we reconstruct as ka. Yeah. Um, Let's look at steel. It's a nice one, the third one, steel. So, uh, yeah, so you have cool. It, it, I mean, we don't need to worry, I think, right now about why Chinese has aspiration there. Um, but it's a, it's a very clear sign of incognito. That's the point. Uh, and then there are um, these examples where Burmese has an aspirate. And Lashi has a, uh, a glottalized, uh, unaspirated voiceless stop. So there's a contrast in Lashi where there isn't in Burmese. So we have to project that contrast back onto Proto Burmish. And uh, Berlin's law is, is the sound change you can think of pre glottalized K changes to KH in, uh, in, in Burmese. So here are examples. Maybe let's look at. Uh, borrow. So key comes from pre-glottalized key. There's pre-glottalization in the, in the Lashi and there's a good Sino-Tibetan uh, cognate. Okay, so that now I can kind of go through this uh, breezily because it's I just have cognates for tsa versus pre-glottalized tsa and cha uh, there are there happen to be no examples of preglottalized cha, ta, and preglottalized ta, pa, and preglottalized pa. I think it's um nice to just uh, take a look at this frog word. So you know I just invite you to take a look at the frog word. Uh, because it has a good Tibetan cognate. 
And then you'll remember that this word fill up came up when we were talking about pre-initials in Chinese, when I was first making the argument for the overall plausibility of pre-initials in Chinese, because uh, it's one of the examples where you have this uh, Bu uh, probably writing a, a pre-initial P. Okay, then um, we also have this distinction between, uh, let's say, plain and preglottalized on S. So here we have uh, a tree, which we looked at before, and look at three, uh, which is the third one down, you know, just to point out that, you know, by, by this point, uh, you're starting to see some of these Sino-Tibetan cognates coming up again and again. Um, but if we look at um, these examples, we see that uh, there was, we can also reconstruct a preglottalized S in Proto-Burmish. And I would draw your attention to, uh, to the word kill in particular, where you'll remember that we had uh, this discussion about maybe the Chinese uh, sarat should in, in fact be reconstructed something like rsat. Um, so you start to form the impression that preglottalization might be a sign of lost prefixes in Burmese. Now I will point uh, you to this word because I find it quite interesting that uh, Burmese does not distinguish the meaning breath and the meaning life, which it makes sense, right? Why not? Why would you? They're, they're, they're clearly related ideas in Latin, for example. Um, but Lashi does distinguish them, where in Lashi, the first one is not preglottalized and the second one is preglottalized. And I think there's nothing that speaks against pushing that distinction back into um, Proto-Burmish and potentially even back into Proto-Sino-Tibetan because you see that, um, uh, let's put it this way, that, the, that uh, just semantically speaking, the Chinese cognate means breath and the Tibetan cognate means life. So if there is a distinction between the two etymon in, in, um, in Proto-Burmish, we might as well, you know, keep that in mind when we're doing Sino-Tibetan cognates. Uh, although, you know, how to fit in this Tibetan word is not totally obvious, but I think it's, it's also unlikely to be unrelated. Okay, and then just to point out that we're, we're sort of pulling apart mergers, they start to interact with each other, right? So we had... Uh, sa comes from sa and sh, and we also have sa comes from plain sa and preglottalized sa. So then actually we get four possible origins of sa in Proto-Burmish. So four, four possible origins of Burmese s in Proto-Burmish, which are plain s, palatalized s, preglottalized plain s, preglottalized palatal s. And here is our preglottalized palatal s, the word for Laos. Um, now, a word on otter, uh, just because, uh, so what I'm doing now is just drawing your attention to problems, right? I think that's one of the most important things to do is say when, in, in a sense, things work for us in terms of an explanation when they throw out problems to solve, but then those problems are problems to solve. Uh, so the word for otter, in um, Burmese, it's Pyam. In Lashi, it's Sham. And the Sham looks like a very good cognate for Tibetan, but a very bad cognate for Burmese. So, so actually, the, the more closely related language uh, is showing a more, a more problematic cognate. Uh, so Burmese points to a, 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 a P or a preglottalized P, and Lashi points to a pre-glottalized palatal sibilant. I don't know how, you know how to deal with it, so you tell me. Okay, now just to say that this Burling's Law has its kind of analog with the resonance, but um, for the obstruents, we get a merger, right? We have basically, uh, just to sum summarize, 
B goes to P, P goes to PH, and preglottalized P also goes to PH. So you have a merger. Whereas uh, with the resonance, there's no merger, it's just a, a difference. So you have uh, N goes to N, and preglottalized N goes to NH. So this is just to show you the preglottalized N goes to NH. Uh, let's look at uh, the first two words. So borrow has a good Tibetan cognate as well that also has a pre-initial. So, so I'm sort of building plausibility for a relationship still between pre-initials in, in, um, in Sino-Tibetan, let's say, and um, pre-glottalization in Burmese or in Proto-Burmish. And then uh, I will just point to this word for bird. There are cognates in, in Chinese. I put them on the slide. Uh, but it also looks a lot like words for bird in, I think, in Austroasiatic. I always get Austroasiatic and Austronesian confused. Uh, but that's something to you know keep an eye on. Uh, and let's just look at nose, because it's so uh, lovely, although um, um, actually due to a computer glitch in some cases, I've ended up uh, presenting uh, data twice, which you get here. Uh, but anyhow, you have na in Burmese, no in um, Lashi, and sna in Tibetan. So it's a, it's a lovely set of cognates. Okay. Now, just to say that what we, what we don't get uh, is a clear example of uh, aspirated Y, or if you like, from Proto-Burmish uh, perspective, pre aspirated pre-glottalized Y. Um, Anishi notes only two words and they don't have um, proto-Burmish cognates or they don't have Burmish cognates. <clears throat> and then just sort of cleaning up some details when we're dealing with glottalization. Uh, Burmese zero, and I mean um, by that I mean just orthographic zero, right? Um, it seems to have a, a, a glottal stop initial uh, because you have this same sort of pre-glottalization in uh, Lashi. And uh, as, as I've done in other cases, we see that here's a sound change. It goes from Proto-Burmish to Burmese. Does it affect Achang Chandao? And in this case, we can say very clearly that it does. So this is really the sound change actually that allows you to distinguish this node. So um, the other things we were looking at, Matasov's law, Mangun's law, um, Wolfenden's law, those are just for Burmese. But Burling's law affects Burmese, Achang, and Shandao quite unambiguously. So they branch to, you know, together, they're on the same branch. Uh, you can see this in, in Frighten, for example, where there's, there's no you know, preglottalized and nothing in Achang, but there is in Lashi. Um, okay, but there are some exceptions to Burling's law. So here are some exceptions where Lashi and Atsi don't have preglottalized initials, but uh, Burmese does have aspiration. Most such words have a, an MH in Burmese. You also get the reverse where Lashi has preglottalized stops, uh, but Burmese doesn't have aspiration. So all of these need to be addressed. Yeah. And now we have gotten basically back to, if we undo all of these changes, uh, back to Proto-Burmish. So now I will just sort of uh, tell it the story forward in approximate chronological or order we get Burling's law, the loss of preglottalized consonants. Then we get Mangwun's law, so ut goes to o before velars. We get Wolfenden's law, which is ik goes to ach and ing goes to any. And we get Matasov's law, which is, let's say, loss of uh, palatal, distinct palatals. So now we're to Proto-Burmish, and the rest of the presentation looks um, backwards from Proto-Burmish to Sino-Tibetan. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give two explanations for that. One is just purely orthographic. 
it's the same as a visarga. The, the Burmans said, let's write a visarga. So that's, so I write a visarga, right? Um, that's the kind of, uh, you know, let's say um, surface level uh, explanation. Uh, but what, how do we actually in interpret it? It's a, it's a high tone marker. The Old Burmese basically has exactly the same tonal system as Middle Chinese. Four tones, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of a, a neutral, a glottal stop final, a, a, a rising tone, which is this one marked with Visarga, and a stop final tone. So it's just exactly the same as Middle Chinese. Uh, and I think that it's pretty clear that this kind of tonal system just became in style, you know, in, in, in around, I don't know, uh, 500 uh, throughout uh, East Asia. You have things like it in, um, in Proto-Karen. It's a little bit different uh, in each language. The conditioning environment is different, but you have things like it in Proto-Karen, in Vietnamese, in Burmese, even in Lhasa Tibetan, actually, or at least on the way to Lhasa Tibetan, you get something very, very similar. Okay, so now from Proto-Burmish to Trans-Himalayan, which, which is the same thing as Sino-Tibetan, there seems to have been a merger of ing and in, right? So remember from Wolfenden's law, ing becomes any, uh, but uh, it looks like in and ing on their way to Proto Burmish merge. I won't go into those details. Let's just look at the examples. Uh, so for ing, we have things like neck, name, and long, where um, Tibetan confirms the velar nasal. And uh, for in, we have things like uh, ripe and love and liver and nail, where Tibetan points to a dental final, not a velar final. And just to point out, right, that the Burmese has the nya, this kind of strange nya thing. But the, the other Burmish languages have a velar nasal in these cases. So we, we do know it's a merger of velar nasal and dental nasal to velar nasal in Proto-Burmish. Uh, and then uh, looking at uh, ik, uh, you'll remember we talked, I think, a lot about this word for joint So um, in, when we were looking at Chinese. So here it is in Burmese and Tibetan. Uh, so, so we have ik. Uh, and um, and I don't give any examples of it, I think, because there aren't really any very clear ones, although the number seven, I think, uh, could be one. Uh, so now uh, Dempsey's law, which is the merger of e and i before velars. So remember that according to Wolfenden's law, ach and any reconstruct to ik and ing. So now we're going to to pull apart, let's say, ik and and uh, ing from ek and eng. Yeah. So uh, and Chinese is is really important here because Tibetan also underwent something like uh, Dempsey's law. So uh, so here we look at at the word for uh, kernel, but it's it's. Um, I, I only use kernel because there's some complications using uh, the word heart, but the, it's pretty clear that the, the root, the morpheme uh, is, is heart, uh, which we think is, um, is cognate with uh, the Chinese word for body. And there you have the i vowel, right? The same thing for year and harvest, same thing for joint and joint and, and wood, firewood. So these are all good. That's why I'm sort of just drawing your attention to them by, by saying the meanings. They're all very good Sino-Tibetan cognates. Uh, and then here are examples with um, with the e vowel. So one, we have tech in Chinese. Neck, we have reng in Chinese. Name, we have meng in Chinese. And then conflict, we have uh, something like sarang in Chinese. And I'm not giving the Tibetan cognates here because they're not helpful. They all have e. Okay, and now uh, loss of final R and final L. So comparison with Tibetan shows that Burmese dropped uh, final R and final L. 
So here's final R. We have something like new in Tibetan and um, the, the evidence for this for this R and this and to some extent the L can uh, you can turn to Chinese, but it's really uh, kind of through a glass darkly. It's very complicated, uh, very hard to distinguish in Chinese. So so that's why I'm just I'm just turning to Tibetan for these things because in Tibetan they just write R or they write L. Uh, so uh, new and flat and uh, burn or blaze. These are cases where you know, there's no obstacle to reconstructing R. And here are examples where there's no obstacle to reconstructing L. Oil compared to grease is a nice you know, uh, core vocabulary item uh, where we can reconstruct L. Uh, RL also is lost. Yeah, so you lose R, you lose L, you lose RL, no. No big surprise there. A, a good example to just draw your attention to, kind of for the sake of um, um, remembering it, is the last one here, na, which means to rest or stop in, in Burmese, and uh, nal, which means to sleep in Tibetan. And um, Sagar argues in an article that uh, the West, which is you know where the where it's where the sun sleeps, um, is cognate with this. Okay, now a little caveat um, about Burmese is, okay, does it loses R and L? Well, there's an exception. After the vowel U, L changes to Y in Burmese. So uh, that's quite nice in terms of uh, relative chronology, right? Because you have to have this U to U change precede the general loss of L. And uh, in a few words, Chinese er corresponds to Burmese ui, and this suggests that before the change of ul to ui, there was a change of rl to l. Burmese and Tibetan don't distinguish e from a before dentals, uh, but Chinese does, so we can reconstruct uh, the Chinese form here. Uh, the the word for eight is the clearest example of this, I think, where you have pret in uh, Chinese and you have, you know, uh, uh, I don't know quite how to say it, in um, Old Burmese. Uh, but also we can go with this word for new, where you have uh, ser in, in Tibetan and you have sa in, um, in Burmese. And I'm leaving out the Tibetan because because Tibetan underwent a very similar change. Remember that nu was gsar in, in Tibetan. And this change must precede the, the loss of R in order for uh, R to have conditioned the change. Right? And then um, in some ways, you know, one of the most famous changes in so-called Tibeto-Burman is the merger of a ah and schwa because you know uh, Chinese has its six vowels uh, with this schwa. So here are examples that we can reconstruct a. Ah, you know, it's very very straightforward. Let's look at fish. So you have nga in Burmese and you have nga in Chinese. So you can reconstruct nga, no problem. Uh, and then here are examples that can be reconstructed with a schwa. So let's look at ear. So you have na in uh, Burmese and n in uh, Chinese with a schwa vowel. So you, it's quite easy to just say that the Burmese uh, merged schwa and a. Ah. Okay, but there is some evidence in Burmese for schwa. And I think it's very important because of uh, it touches on the kind of controversy about whether Tibeto Burman is a valid clade. Uh, and uh, just to put my cards on the table, I don't think there's any evidence for that idea. And I will just point out that there's a lot of Tibeto-Burman languages. So proving that all of them share an innovation would be a lot of work. So I think it's strange that for sort of 60 years or something, the field just kind of uh, took for granted that there was such a thing as Tibetan Burman when, when everyone could have known that to prove that would be an immense amount of work. 
and that amount of work had not happened yet. If you ask those people who do believe it, uh, why they believe it, uh, they will, uh, well, I mean, actually the only one who's uh, really put his cards on the table um, is Zev Handel, who in 2008 said, oh, it's the merger of schwa and ah, because you get it in Tibetan and you get it in Burmese and you get it in other languages as far as we can tell. In, um, in um, um, Benedict's reconstruction of Proto-Tibeto-Burman, uh, there is no schwa, so it looks like an innovation across all the Tibetan Burman languages. But here's proof that it's not, because uh, Burmese does point to schwa in some cases. So uh, schwa J and schwa and sorry and A J uh, develop differently, and uh, this means that in terms of relative chronology, this change schwa J to I. Uh, has to have preceded the overall um, merger of uh, schwa with ah. In his review of my book, uh, uh, Zef Handel brings uh, this question up, and he thinks he can kind of uh, save it by uh, treating these as, as unitary items, right? There's no reason to expect, in a sense, that the language treated the schwa in schwa j in the same way that it did uh, sort of schwa in uh, Schwa K, for example. I, I wasn't able to completely follow his, his argument. You can look if you want. Um, but anyhow, he, he seems to think that this is not the kind of the silver bullet to disproving the Tibeto Burman hypothesis that I uh, think it is. But in any case, let's show you the evidence. AJ turns into A. Yeah? So you have like add. Kre in, in Chinese and kra. Here are examples where the schwa j turns into i. So the word for fire, sorry, the Chinese character is kind of a slightly too fancy a character for my software to have been happy with. So it doesn't display correctly. Um, but you have a schwa j in, in, in Chinese in, in burn, in draw near, and in tail. And you see that in all three cases, you get an I in Burmese. So I think there's really good evidence of a sound change, right? And it seems like Tibetan has uh, an, an E vowel in these cases. So Tibetan also didn't you know, merge uh, uh, schwa, J, and, and AJ. Uh, but uh, we only have you know, two of the three do we have Tibetan cognates for. OK. Now, uh, moving on, you know, uh, still sort of further back in time, if you like, we're interested in this mysterious vowel UIW, which, which I think I just treat as UIW throughout my book, because uh, there's a controversy uh, about how to analyze it in, in old uh, Burmese, and I sort of want to avoid that, because from a structural perspective, you can work its, con uh, its correspondences out but with Tibetan and Chinese without knowing how it was pronounced in old Burmese, right? So, Generally, it corresponds to a U in Tibetan. Chinese offers both U and O correspondences. So look, if you have a UU correspondence, you should reconstruct it U, right? And I think these cognates are pretty rock solid. Person in Burmese, body in um, Tibetan, and he in Burmese, it can also mean who in Burmese, but uh, it's a pronoun in Burmese where, uh, where it's only an interrogative pronoun in Tibetan. Those are clear cognates. But there are very few examples of this UU correspondence, and that bothers me. OK, and then similarly, which we, we all discussed when we were talking about uh, Chinese, O corresponding to O. Tibetan also has O in some of these cases. Um, so O, 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 you would reconstruct as O, right? But again, there's kind of fewer examples than you would want. So how do we reconstruct this, right? U, U, we use, for, we use U for that. Uh, o, O, we use O for that. So we can't use U, we can't use O. And I have no idea. I, I use schwa uh, W for something else. So I, I just index it as U, W. And I, that's a purely mechanical uh, solution. But we get it in, uh, in nine, for instance, where uh, Tibetan and Chinese point to you. 
Burmese, you would like to reconstruct you, you know, it really looks like you should reconstruct you, but then we can't use you for the UU correspondence. So this UIW is a bit of a problem for me. Now, as I also mentioned in, um, in the discussion of um, Chinese, uh, the, the correspondence UIW in Burmese to O in Chinese, I reconstruct as Schwa W. And I went through the advantages and disadvantages of that uh, yesterday. But here are some examples. So we have breast, um, steel, horn. We're just looking at breast, you know, so you have Ui, however it was pronounced in Old Burmese, and then No for milk or nipple in, um, in Chinese. So I think the whole question uh, needs to be re-examined with a more thorough reconstruction of Proto-Burmish or burmo chinese particularly in light of the fact that, as I um, mentioned on the first day, uh, burmo chinese languages tend to have a, a velarized, non-velarized distinction on their vowels, which is lost in the Burmish languages. So one way of understanding what's going on here is the reconstruction of uh, stop final syllables is pretty straightforward for Proto-Burmish, let's say, or even for Sino-Tibetan from the Proto-Burmish perspective. But the reconstruction of open syllables, you, you have more correspondences than you want. You have these things like, you know, U, U, uh, and U, I, W, U, and um, why do you have so many correspondences in open syllables? Uh, it's probably because the velarized, non-velarized vowel distinction uh, lasted longer in open syllables. I'm not a phonetician, but I'm told that there's reason to think that that would happen. Um, so uh, probably this would all become clearer and my reconstructions would get better if we took the perspective of burmo Changik and added a lot more uh, Gyarong data and, and looked at like, oh, maybe the difference between these different U's and different O's has to do with one's velarized, one's not velarized. Uh, and now moving on uh, again to uh, what I call Pieros and Starostin's law, which is the loss of uvulars in uh, Burmese. Um, and I'll just say that I think Tibeto-Burman correspondences provide a very good argument for the reconstruction of uvulars in Chinese. So uh, to, to formulate it the other way around, you saw that we have Sheshang series evidence for reconstructing uvulars in, in Chinese, but then those cog the cognates of those behave differently in, in Tibeto-Burman. So here we go. Uh, a uvular in Chinese corresponds to a zero initial, which we know is a glottal initial in Burmese, with house, I think, as being a really nice example. Tibetan has a velar in these cases. So, so one way to put it is you can reconstruct to Sino-Tibetan, you can reconstruct uvulars by just saying zero initial in Burmese, velar in Tibetan, we reconstruct that as a uvular. And then it just happens to be the case uh, that um, those, those cognates that exist in Chinese tend to be uh, uvular. For labio uvulars, we have initial wa in Burmese, which is kind of what you'd expect, right? You can basically always get the answer what happens to uh, uvulars in Burmese by just dropping the uvular. And then if there's a vowel, you just have a vowel initial. If there's a W, you have a W initial. And if there's an R, you have an R initial. Now, there are some exceptions, like here you get uh, velars, basically, where you would expect um, uh, nothing because uh, uh, Chinese has a uvular. And I don't know, maybe the problem is in Chinese. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe these Chinese examples should be revisited. Bird comes up. And that might be, uh, I, I don't have this in the book, but in the meantime, I've noticed that uh, you have it in. Um, in, in other language families. So maybe it's just not a cognate, maybe it's a vonderbord, and that explains the irregular correspondence. Um, and then you can also have cases where the correspondence makes you want a, a, a Chinese uvular, but you don't get one. 
So maybe in these cases, uh, we should reconstruct a uvula, right? That's the problem with Chinese is, is Chinese, it's not like you just get it. Oh, it's written uvular, it's getting written velar. It takes a lot of, um, of work to figure out. Okay, and now uh, this one's quite uh, interesting, I think, uh, where you get a W in uh, Burmese, where you have a P in Tibetan, uh, with pig probably being the clearest examples. You have wak in Burmese, and you have pak in, um, in Tibetan. And for a long time, uh, people have thought that this is kind of a, some kind of a lenition that's triggered by a lost prefix. I see no problem with that explanation sort of uh, mechanically. You know, we can just index the correspondence with a capital C at the beginning, but it, it feels a little bit um, like a trick. Uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, La Yunfan actually is, is working on this uh, from, again, from the Yarong perspective, and uh, will have exciting things to say soon about uh, Lenition in Sino Tibetan. Uh, we can also use the same kind of uh, machinery since, since we proposed it for this reconstruction, which is a T in Tibetan corresponding to an R in uh, Burmese, where I think the, we say parada by spiel, is, um, is weave. So it seems like the Sino Tibetans knew how to weave. You have a very nice correspondence between uh, the word in Tibetan and the word in Chinese. Uh, and then you think, think like, well, look, the, the, the Burmese or Rak is not a coincidence. It must be a cognate. Uh, but why does it have this R initial instead of a T initial? Well, let's stick a capital C in front of it and pretend that we solved the problem. Now, since we're doing that, I would say, why not use it in the verb uh, to see? Because, you know, see is kind of a basic idea. If Tibetan and Burmese are related, you ex would expect them to have cognates. Uh, and then you can bring together these things that look quite different, matong and uh, mrang, if you reconstruct matong. And, and, you know, maybe the M is, in fact, the pre-initial that's triggering the lenition here. Uh, but we don't know that, so I leave the capital C anyhow. And I'll just mention that this proposal of mine, I think uh, other people see as a little bit too speculative in part because of the vowel correspondence, but that's because I see uh, there as being some kind of real oblaut in Sino-Tibetan, whereas other people don't. Okay, and then another very interesting uh, correspondence that, that in my book I treat as just an outright, uh, you know, irregularity, a mystery, but I think now I'm tempted to see as part of this overall phenomenon of lenition is a su correspondence uh, in, or a su in Burmese, where you have a tsa in Tibetan. So let's look at the word for son. Uh, that's like son, like child. So you have sa in Burmese. You have tsa in atsi, which is to say it's a it's a quite specific to Burmese change. You have tsabo for uh, nephew or grandson in Tibetan. So you know Chinese will immediately think of tsa in Chinese. And then I just throw in tangmi for a very specific reason. So the C in tangmi is pronounced as tsa. So it's a son, Tongmi. Uh, and then you have daughter, Tsa Mi, uh, looks like it must be a cognate. Tsa, Tsa Mai in Tongmi is not a coincidence with uh, Sa, Sa Mi in, um, in um, Burmese, which I think means we have to see this, these as old words. And you know, you, you may say, okay, Nathan, yeah, the words for son and daughter are old, you know, a uh, big deal. Well, uh, Mark Miyaki has come up with a very interesting proposal that these are, uh, in Burmese, pew substrate words. And why does he propose that? Because in pew, the change of tsa to sa is regular. So you can explain this aberrant correspondence from substrate influence. Uh, but I say, why don't we reconstruct a, a pre-initial capital C here which we see as having this lenition effect. And you could even imagine that it's something like uh, there was a little vowel there. And so you had something like, um, let's just say the pre-initial was a ta, I don't know, for fun. So you had something like ta, tsa, and then maybe it voiced to ta, tsa, and then maybe it lenited to ta, tsa, then maybe you lost the initial and you just ended up with za. And then remember that a, you know, a z uh, would have changed into an s on the way to Burmese. So I think something like that is a nice story. 
I was inspired to make this change uh, because of this forthcoming work of, of La Yunfan. Um, so Krosschap, which is a, a kind of Gyaronic language, um, uh, has this word piglet, uh, pakzi, or peitzi, pe and it has the word sun, z. So uh, his solution is to reconstruct uh, kutze as the source for z. In core, core Galronic languages, body parts, kinship terms, and other relevant nouns, I think I mentioned this in another class, uh, have this inalienable prefix uh, te. So you get it with father and mother and son. You get it for son, yeah? So uh, remember, we think uh, Galronic is related to Burmese pretty closely. They're both Burma Chungic. So if this inalienable prefix uh, existed at the um, Burma Chang'ak level and induced lenition, then you know this correspondence is solved. Uh, final K goes back to both final K and Q, which are distinguished based on Chinese evidence, right? So here everybody has K, no surprise, uh, but we have this example uh, of K in Burmese and well stop in Chinese, which I reconstruct as Q. And then uh, zero in Burmese corresponds to K in Chinese, which I reconstruct as this K uh, schwa, where maybe sun, let's look at the sun like sun in the sky, sun uh, as a third example is maybe the clearest. Uh, and now I can uh, just talk you through summary of, of these changes. So uh, in something like the order from Sino-Tibetan to Burmese, you have uh, the loss of k, the change of final uh, uvular into final velar, lenition of stops, Pierosin's Thorosin's law, which is the loss of uvulars. Then you have these vowel changes, which I won't go through because it would just be uh, uh, boring to hear me read them out, that have to have happened before the merger of a and schwa. Then you have uh, e turns to a before dentals, rl changes to l which has to have happened before UL changes to UY, then the loss of R and L, then Dempsey's law, the merger of A and E before velars, then the merger of ing and in, and now you've gotten back to proto burmish So these are the changes that go from Sino-Tibetan to proto burmish And one thing I'm very happy about in this case is we are able to figure out a lot of the relative chronology, which we were not able to do in the case of Chinese, because in the case of Chinese, they were all mergers that didn't interact. When we're looking for cognates, I don't think we should preemptively remove things that could be explained using uh, onomatopoeia, because then we're preventing ourselves from seeing cognates where they might exist. Because the the, the proto language may well have had onomatopoetic stuff in it that uh, that was inherited. Yeah. So the question is, does it follow the rules or not? Yeah. So if uh, something doesn't follow the rules, then you can say, uh, we can dismiss it because it's an onomatopoeia. But if it does follow the rules, why not reconstruct it? That's my feeling. Making arguments for long distance relationships based on uh, um, these kind of cognates before you have worked out the sound changes would be a, a bad idea. And I agree with that. There's a section uh, in the last chapter of my book where I sort of look into this. I'm not, I'm not sure I actually look enough at um, the origins of medial Y in Burmese, uh, but certainly in terms of R and L, you have cases where, um, let's just make up uh, an example. Uh, Burmese has something like klang, and Chinese just has lang and Tibetan has brang or something like that. If you wanted to propose that all laterals in Sino-Tibetan occurred in the uh, initial position and lateral clusters arose only uh, because of pre-initial uh, prefixation, I think that there's good reason to think that, but that um, a lot of work would need to go into figuring out 
you know, the morphological meaning of these affixes. That's really right at the cutting edge of Sino-Tibetan etymology. Uh, and all I could do in my book was really just gather together the evidence. But Werner, when he discovered Werner's law, uh, he, he, he just read an article that assembled exceptions to, um, to um, Grimm's law. Nowadays, if, if, if I tried to publish an article, which was just a collection of exceptions to a sound change, I think it would have a lot of trouble being published. Right? People would say, well, this is, there's nothing new here, and you don't have a theory, and, you know, uh, but actually, uh, that's extremely valuable work to do, and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe since I wrote a book and not an article, I was able to get away with that sort of thing, and my hope is that readers will just read it and be like, whoa, it's so obvious, why didn't he notice that the, the origin of, you know, <laughs> medial ya in Burmese is this other thing, right, in, in the way that we saw with, with Werner's Law, but that's really, um, you will say it's a good it's the right question i don't have an answer and and i hope that you know when you just uh, look at the examples in in my book uh, some answers will pop out at you the y definitely not and the r and l i would say generally speaking if you want to talk about the tibeto burman hypothesis the best evidence is the change of e to a before dentals in both Tibetan and Burmese, and the merger of both eng and ing to, well, let's say ing in, um, in uh, both Tibetan and Burmese. Uh, but that would only prove the tibeto burman hypothesis in a kind of narrow sense that Tibetan uh, and Burmese are more closely related than either one is to Chinese, yeah? and fine, I think actually I probably believe that, uh, but that leaves aside, you know, the question of where uh, Karen goes or where Kiranti goes or whatnot, right? I think that's, that, that is the version of the tibeto burman hypothesis that everything goes together except for Chinese. Everything, even languages we know nothing about because no one has ever worked on them, must be related more closely to each other than Chinese. That seems crazy to me.